Hello. Today I'm going to walk you through uh, the AQA Science Biology Unit 1 Foundation paper. Um, all I'm going to say about the, the front page is obviously make sure you've filled in all the relevant details. Please bring, a, bring your own calculator, don't rely on the school to, to supply those and it is preferred that you fill this in with black ink. Okay, the pages are scanned into a computer for marking and it makes it much, much easier that process if everything's filled in in black ink. So do do that, please. So straight in to uh, question one, and you can see there we've got a photograph, an athlete at the start of a race. The athlete's sense organs contain special cells. These special cells detect changes in the environment. So we've got two lists. List A shows the changes in the environment and list B shows some of the athlete's sense organs. You have to draw one line, okay, that's in bold for a reason. If you draw more than one line, you won't get the mark. Uh, from each change in the environment in list A to the sense organ detecting the change in list B. So, um, site of the finish line. So the organ responsible for that is obviously going to be the eye. The sound of the starting gun at the beginning of the race, that's going to be detected by the ear. And pressure of the ground on the fingers, those pressure receptors are found in the skin. Okay, so nose is the only sense organs not used in this instance. Part two, which cells detect changes in the environment? The, so the choices here are gland cells, muscle cells, and receptor cells. And hopefully you'd put a tick just there for receptor cells. Part B, during the race, the concentration of sugar in the athlete's blood decreases. Why does it decrease? And what they're looking for here is that that sugar uh, is going to be used, is used to provide energy, which would get you the mark but ideally you'd say, sorry, energy through or via respiration. Okay, part C, if I just scroll up there. Um, some athletes use anabolic steroids to improve performance. Draw a ring around the correct answer to complete the sentence. Anabolic steroids increase breathing rate, growth of muscles, or heart rate. So we need to put a ring around the growth of muscles. C part two, sporting regulations ban the use of anabolic steroids. Suggest one reason why, you only need one. Um, one that would spring to mind there would be side effects from taking the steroids. Okay, so the impacts on lots of organs inside the body, okay? Um, but also the idea of fairness or the fact that it's it's simply cheating to take steroids, okay? Question two. Many organisms are adapted to avoid being eaten. The photograph shows a gecko on a leafy branch. So you can just make out the gecko there, there's its tail, and there's a leaf. The gecko is adapted to avoid being eaten by predators, explain how. And there's two marks up for grabs here. So your first mark will come from saying quite simply um, that the gecko has camouflage. Um, and I, I really always talk about stating the obvious here, which means uh, that the predator is less likely whoops, to see and therefore eat the gecko. And that's all you need really, just ensuring you've got those two points in. Instead of camouflage, you, you could have simply said it looks like a leaf um, and you'd have got the mark for saying that. It really is about stating the obvious, I think, that question. Um, two part B. Ants can give a, a painful bite. The photograph shows a type of plant living on acacia trees. Acacia trees have thorns on their branches. Okay. Question following on from that. To 
could be part one. Predators are less likely to eat ants living on acacia trees than ants living on the ground. Suggest why. And what we need to get across here is the idea that the, uh, the thorns of the trees themselves uh, will hurt any predators. Oops. And put them off from actually going for the ants and actually trying to eat the ants. And 2B part 2, giraffes do eat the leaves of acacia trees, but they do not eat the leaves of acacia trees that have ants living on them. Suggest why? One mark for this. Um, and you need to get across here that they avoid being bitten by the ants. So they're put off from eating those because they've got those ants on them. Okay, two parts C, two photographs, one of a wasp and one of a hoverfly. The wasp and the hoverfly uh, both have black and yellow stripes. There's the wasp, there's the hoverfly. Wasps have stings, but hoverflies do not. So these guys can't sting you. The stripes on the hoverfly help the hoverfly to avoid being eaten by predators, explain why. And if you have a look there, there are two marks up for grabs here, okay? So um, your first mark for coming, will come for simply saying that the, the hoverfly mimics or looks like a wasp. Those colourings look very, very similar. And that means, so, any predators think that it can sting. And you can see that's a real benefit. Okay. Question three. Students in a school investigated the effect of five different antibiotics, A, B, C, D, and E, on one type of bacterium. The students grew the bacteria on agar jelly in a Petri dish, soaked separate paper discs in each of the antibiotics, put the paper discs onto the bacteria in the Petri dish, put the Petri, Petri dish into an incubator, and this diagram shows what the dish looked like after three days. Okay, so these rings going around the paper discs are where there's no bacteria growing. So straight away I'm looking here and I'm seeing, see the bacteria growing right the way up to this disc. So that's our, most likely our control disc. And you can see there that D has got the biggest circle of all. Okay, so just bear that in mind as we go through this question. 3A part 1. What is the maximum temperature the incubator should be set at in school? Now I'm sure you've gone through this and done this practical in class. And you should know that uh, 25 degrees is the maximum temperature that uh, we're allowed to incubate those. And the reason for that is um, at higher temperatures, uh, you might get growth of pathogens. Okay, so that's disease causing bacteria and they're likely to grow if you, if you were to grow them in any hotter than 25 degrees. 3B, I think we've already answered really. Um, which antibiotic, A, B, C, D, or E, would be best to treat a disease caused by this type of bacterium? Write your answer in the bo box and give an answer. Okay, so if I go back to the beginning here, that's what we said. The disc that's got the largest zone of inhibition, the biggest uh, circle around it where the bacteria do not grow, that is the most effective. So it's a simple case there. The answer to the question would be and the reason for that would be um, most bacteria killed or you could have said the biggest area the biggest ring where there were no bacteria growing and that would have got you the mark as well okay 3c very common question and quite a hot topic about the place as well. Antibiotics cannot be used to treat diseases caused by viruses. Why? Tick one box. So our options, viruses are not pathogens. There are too many different types of virus. 
all viruses live inside cells and I'm hoping you would put your tick just there okay this is why antibiotics do not work for viruses okay question four there are two forms of peppered moth dark and pale birds eat the moths when the moths are resting on tree bark pollution in the atmosphere may kill lichens living on tree bark make the bark of trees go black okay so 4a draw a ring around the correct answer to complete the sentence lichens are very sensitive to air pollution caused by sulfur dioxide okay and 4b the photograph shows the two forms of peppered moth on tree bark so there's the dark form on a tree and there's the pale form of the moth this tree's covered with lichens and then when we've got pollution hopefully you can see that the dark moth is much more tricky to spot for predators to spot but the pale moth is very easy to spot okay let's have a look at the question the dark form of the peppered moth was produced by a change in the genetic material of a pale moth use one word from the box to complete the sentence characteristic clone or mutation a change in genetic material is called a and I've no doubt you all get this one right mutation okay 4b part 2 three mark question in the 19th century pollution made the bark of many trees go black explain why the population of the pale form of the moths in forests decreased the population of the dark form of the moths in forests increased so why do we get less pale forms and why do we get more dark forms after this pollution focusing on the pale form initially i would simply say that the pale form and again you see what i keep saying about stating the obvious the pale form um, now more easily seen or spotted okay there's a mark for saying that this means whoops um, the pale form is more likely to be eaten And that in turn means that the pale form is less likely oops, is less likely to breed and pass on the mutation for the pale form. If I was going to talk about the dark form I just need to flip that on its head and say the opposite so the dark form is less easily seen less likely to be eaten and therefore more likely to breed and pass on that mutation for the dark form okay um, but what I put there will actually get you the three marks you could just put the other three points here for completing the same sake but I'm gonna leave it like that okay see part one the larvae young of the peppered moths eats the leaves of birch trees the diagram shows the food chain birch trees trees being eaten by peppered moth larvae being eaten by birds draw a pyramid of biomass for this food chain and label the pyramid okay there's two marks for this you're going to get one mark for drawing it correctly and you're going to get one mark for labeling it correctly okay and people really seem to struggle with this one i get all sorts when we mark this one um but what we'll be looking for is whoops and I would use a ruler if I was in an exam. Apologies for this. So there's my pyramid. So I've got diminishing size that way. Um, and I would label, this is gonna be my birch trees. And I would label that. Um, this would be my larvae. That's the second one okay and the top layer will be the birds one mark for this 
one mark for getting your label. Okay. C part two. Which two reasons explain the shape of the pyramid you drew in C part one? So what they're asking is why is it diminishing as you go up the pyramid? And it's very important that we got two boxes. I get lots of people only ticking one because they, they forget about this. Um, so some material is lost in waste from the birds. Okay, so you can tick that one. Um, the peppered moth larvae do not eat all of the leaves from the trees. Okay, so you're not getting all of that biomass across. It would be incorrect to tick. The trees are much larger than peppered moth larvae and the trees do not use all of the sun's energy. Okay, question five, but recycling. The pie chart shows the different types of waste from an average household in England. Okay, so just have a little look at that for a half a minute or so. Okay, so there's the non-recyclable waste. Glass, metal, plastic, paper, organic kitchen waste. So 35% organic kitchen waste is the most. I'm taking that in. Okay, five part A. In 2010, councils in England collected 23 million tonnes of waste from households. Most of the waste was put into landfill sites. Councils pay to use land landfill sites. Organic kitchen waste can be put onto compost heaps. Calculate the mass of organic kitchen waste from households that could have been put onto compost heaps in 2010. Okay, so this is why we warned you about the um, needing a calculator because this is the one question where you're going to need it. Okay, so 35%, the total is 23 million, so they're asking you what is 35% of 23 million tons? Okay, so main points here, always show your work in. That just ensures that if you did get the question wrong, you would at least pick up one mark for, for the correct work in Okay, Don't just dive in and, and put the answer there. See that as a fairly common mistake. So 35% as a percentage would be 35 divided by 100. And all I've got to do is multiply that by 23 because it's uh, 23 million tons the answer is in million tons so we have to mess about with with a huge figure there and if you tap that into your calculator it does come up as 8.05 so I would write it in there and that would be enough uh, for your two marks okay some householders put organic kitchen waste onto their compost heaps so just one advantage of this to the council, well, clearly they're going to use less landfill sites. And that'd be a huge saving to the council, which also would score the mark if you just put that, it would save the, the council cost. Okay, um, so just one advantage of this to the householder. Well, that compost can be put to work. Um, they can put the compost onto their own garden in or on own garden, and that will help provide nutrients for whatever they are growing in that garden. Okay. Question six, the photograph shows two breeds of cow, Frisian and a Jersey. In parts A and B, draw a ring around the correct answer to complete each sentence. Okay, 6A, cows produce their young calves by asexual reproduction, cloning or sexual reproduction. Well, they have two parents, whoops, that's going to be sexual reproduction. Part B, cows and their calves have many similar characteristics. The information for characteristics is carried by clones, embryos, or genes. And I'm going to need it again, circle, genes. Okay, 6B, part two. This question came up in 2014 as well um, in a biology paper. The information for characteristics is passed to the next generation in cells called, so what's the scientific name for sex cells? And the answer is, gametes. Very common question that. Okay, six part C. Frisian and Jersey cows can both be used for meat or to produce milk. 
the information shows features of Frisian and Jersey cows. So it's worth reading this table before we even look at the question. So Frisian cows, they can have a body mass up to 600. These guys only 400. 3.4% protein, these have 3.8% protein. They can be milked 325 days after giving birth, whereas these guys can be milked only 250 days after giving birth. They produce no milk for 55 days before having a calf and these Jersey cows only 45 days before but Frisian cows can produce 30 litres of milk per day and Jersey cows produce less than 30 litres of milk per day. Okay. Here's the question then. And I think it's important that we emphasise this. It says use only the information above. Okay, so if you did have some prior knowledge of, uh, of farming and or you read around the subject then you might be tempted to put something in but the fact that it says only use this information means you might not be marked correctly for that so do bear that in mind in your answers you must make comparisons between the two breeds of cow okay 6c part 1 give two advantages to a farmer of keeping Frisian cows and not Jer Jersey cows so why should we keep these cows and not these two marks and I would focus in on this one and I would focus in on this one I think they're the two most obvious ones as an advantage so putting this into words all you need to say is that Frisian cows provide more meat 600 kilograms than Jersey cows because they only give you 400 okay same for the milk okay so Frisian oops Frisian cows provide more milk and that's greater than 30 liters than the Jersey cows which provide less than 30 liters okay so you got your two marks there Okay, we just have to do the same now. Um, give two advantages of a farmer keeping Jersey cows and not freezing cows. So why should you keep these cows and not these? So turn this on its head now. So looking across there, we got more protein um, and we've got more milk in time because before giving birth to a calf, they have 45 days where they don't produce any milk Whereas these guys, there's an additional 10 days where they don't produce milk. Okay, so that's what we're going to state there. So, part one. Again, it, make sure you make that, that comparison between the two. Um, so, Jersey cows produce milk with more protein and I would put the data in there just double check that's 3.8 percent 3.8 percent than Frisian so they produce 3.4 percent okay the second point then was about milk production before having a calf. So Jersey cows do not produce milk 45 days before giving birth
whilst Frisian do not produce milk. Five days before giving birth. So that's a real advantage. You get an extra 10 days where they're actually producing milk. Six part D. Cow's milk is different from human milk. Cow's milk should not be given to young human babies. However, scientists in China have genetically engineered cows to produce human milk. Milk from these cows can be fed to young human babies. Um, so the actual question, what is genetic engineering? Tick one box, make sure you only tick one, remember. Um, and out of the options, genes from one organism are transferred to a different organism. There's a spot on there, just double check. Cells are separated from an embryo and are transferred to host mothers, no. The nucleus from a body cell is transferred to an egg cell. No, so just double check there, that is the correct answer. 6D part two. Some people are worried about using milk from genetically engineered cows to feed human babies. Give one reason why. The most obvious answer to me would be um, possible, I guess, unknown at this stage, side effects. The effects on the long-term health of the child. Okay, question seven. In the 1800s, many women died from disease after giving birth. Dr. Semmelweis compared the death rates of women in two hospital wards, Ward A and Ward B, and this table shows that information. So 1834, 36, 44 and 46, and the percentage of women who died. And straight away you're seeing lots of people in Ward A and not so many in Ward B, although they were very similar in 1834. Okay, so let's have a little look closer. Before 1840, doctors and nursing walked in Ward A and Ward B. The doctors often worked in other wards with patients who had diseases. The doctors did not wash their hands. After 1840, doctors only worked in Ward A and not in Ward B. So we've got no doctors in this side over here. Okay. After 1840 in this column. But doctors in Ward A all the time. Only nurses worked in Ward B. The nurses did not work in other wards with patients who had diseases. Okay. Look at the data for Ward A and Ward B after 1840. Let me take that up to there. Describe the effect on death rate of having only nurses working in Ward B and not doctors. To gain full marks, you must refer to the data. Okay, so make sure you use the data. So I think I would focus on 1846. That's such a pronounced difference there. So I would say there is a lower percentage of deaths in 1844 and 1846 okay one mark I think for saying the lower percentage of deaths um, and then to compare the figures I would simply say for example in 1846 there were 11.3% deaths in Ward A with the doctors, but only 2.8% deaths in Ward A part two, can you set, suggest an explanation for this, these differences that you described? Okay, two marks up for grabs here. So um, the clear answer in Ward B, 
after 1840 doctors whoops doctors were not transferring pathogens to the women. In 1847, Dr. Semmelweis told the doctors to wash their hands each time before they began to work in Ward A. Table 2 shows the death rates in the two wards after 1847. So you can see a huge de decrease now. There's not much difference between the two wards at all. Dr. Semmelweis was right to tell doctors to wash their hands. What evidence is there to support Dr. Semmelweis telling the doctors to wash their hands? Use information from both tables in your answer. Here I would say um, in Ward A, a much lower percentage percentage of deaths after doctors started washing their hands. also point out that um, percentage deaths were similar now to Ward B. So there was no difference between Ward A and Ward B. And I would show that I've looked at both tables by saying that it's a decrease of 9.3% from 1846 to 1849 in Ward A. 7C, in modern hospitals less than 0.1% of women die from, giving, from disease after giving birth. Medical understanding has improved since the 1850s to reduce the death rate. Other than improvements in hygiene, give two reasons for the low death rate from infectious diseases in modern hospitals. Okay, um, so there I think we could mention vaccination or knowledge of immunity, and we could also talk about better drugs or knowledge of drugs such as antibiotics to fight off infections okay we could also talk about stabilization stabilization of equipment or isolation of patients that are infected in the knowledge that we know we should keep these patients apart to stop infection okay okay question eight scientists investigated the effectiveness of three slimming programs a b and c the scientists recorded the body mass of four groups of volunteers each month for six months. Three of the groups were each given a different slimming program and the fourth group was a control group. The graph shows the mean change of body mass each month for all four groups. So before we go any further, let's just have a good look at this graph. So you can see there the control group is the solid line there and it's sort of varying over those six months. We've got A, B and C, the various slimming programs. And these, if you're below this line, you're putting on weight. And if you're above this line, you're losing weight. OK. A part one. What should the control group eat? Well, clearly, we want the control group to change nothing. We want them to keep the same. So I would, I would, I would state there to follow their normal diet the idea there that uh, 
we don't change anything they just keep eating what they normally eat same as before same as usual or simply a balanced diet and why do we why do the scientists include a control group okay just like in any investigation uh, the idea is to allow a comparison okay and this uh, allows us to judge and, and to ensure that a test is valid okay or tell us if um, and allow us to see if the slim in pro programs actually work okay okay 8b1 the three groups of volunteers using the slimming programs each showed a similar pattern of body mass over the six months describe this pattern okay so I have a quick look back and what we've got all three rapid rapid loss in uh, in body mass especially in that first month and then the rate that they're losing mass you can see is getting less and less and less and you can see they're not losing much body mass at all at the end of six months okay so two marks for two points first mark for saying that there's an initial rapid loss of body mass for all three programs and then a smaller loss over time or leveling off okay b part two all the slimming programs seem to be effective how does the information in the graph show this well again it's showing that all three programs A, B and C show a loss in body mass okay okay final question nine in this question you'll be assessed on using good English, organised information clearly and using specialist terms where appropriate. This is a six mark question. The diagram shows part of the carbon cycle, so you're all familiar with this. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, green plants, animals, microorganisms, a very simple diagram. And the question is asking you, quite simply, to describe how living things are involved in the constant cycling of carbon. Okay, so we're emphasis now purely on the living things and how they how they work within the carbon cycle. So straight away, green plants. I'm thinking about photosynthesis and carbon there is in the form of CO2. Those green plants are going to take that CO2 through photosynthesis, turn it into into sugars, into carbohydrates, into various compounds. The animals are clearly going to eat the green plants to get their carbon they're going to respire which is going to re return carbon dioxide to the atmosphere you could also mention the fact that green plants are going to respire Oops. Uh, and that's going to return carbon dioxide the animals when they produce waste um, when they die okay they're going to be broken down by microorganisms which are going to decay whoops it's going to break down those compounds that process um, again will return carbon dioxide to the atmosphere um, and the green plants as well when they die when they lose their leaves so when they die they're going to be broken down and decay by the microorganisms as well so that's my general sort of ideas that i'm going to talk about and I think I would approach this as, you know, basically just telling the story of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and just showing how it is moved around and returned by these living things. So that little diagram is basically my, my plan, I guess. Um, so there we go. So I'd start by saying that uh, green plants...
photosynthesize. Check the spelling. Um, which takes in carbon dioxide. This carbon is used to make carbohydrate. Protein uh, possibly enzymes. Okay. Carbon inside the plant's been used to make I mean I could put an example there, cellulose as well, as, as an example of a carbohydrate. I would now say that uh, animals eat eat plants. To, the, to get their carbohydrates, I would say both plants and animals respire and this process, respiration, returns carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. I would say when plants and animals die then microorganisms check the spelling so I'm repeated it already uh, the microorganisms decompose or break down feed on the dead organisms and I would simply finish by saying that microorganisms also respire returning carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Um, the carbon that's in the soil then of course is still going to be moved around but it's not asking you to talk about that, it's asking you to talk about how living things move the carbon around and I think we're covering it all there. So we have plants photosynthesizing, animals eating the plants, both respire, returning carbon dioxide. When they die, I could also put in there or produce waste, then microorganisms decompose or feed on the dead organisms. Microorganisms also respire and that will return carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And I think that covers it all. So that's the end of Biology AQA Unit 1 Foundation paper. I will be posting some more for, for other units, the Foundation initially, Chemistry and Physics, and then I will turn to the higher papers, eventually looking at additional science and triple science as well. Hope this is of use to you. Happy revising.